Thank you so much to Dr. Bascom and Dr. Maitland. And I believe we have them both here now uh, for some questions. Uh, Dr. Bascom, if you're able to put your video on. Perfect, I see you both now. Okay, we're going to, hello. We're gonna start with a question for Dr. Maitland. Um, and I imagine there's not a definitive answer for this, but your opinion. Does hypermobile EDS cause MCAS or does MCAS cause hypermobile EDS? Okay, so why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> no, you know, so here's the thing. It, so if you have dysfunctional collagen, your mast cells are going to respond because there's tissue injury. On the other hand, if you have a mast cell that has some type of underactive or overactive component, it has the ability to kick out enzymes that can modify the connective tissue. So it's just a question of what stops, what starts the vicious cycle. So um, as Dr. Okula had brought up before, um, mast cells have had the ability to kick out certain chemicals that, uh, including histamine, but chymase and tryptase can modify the connective tissue. And that was demonstrated in individuals that have hyperalpha tryptasemia. So there's more research to be done, but I think it's a two-way street. Thank you very much. And to Dr. Bascom, is uh, sleep apnea related to EDS? Sleep disruption is very clearly associated with EDS and, and poor sleep quality, uh, non-restful sleep um, is definitely uh, an issue. Uh, people who have EDS may also have obstructive sleep apnea, which is a condition where the upper airway um, relaxes and temporarily closes off during sleep. And then as the body responds to that, it triggers a, an adrenaline reaction and, and an arousal, a respiratory arousal, um, and can be diagnosed with a sleep study uh, and then can be treated with, um, with CPAP. So a few things, a few points related to that. One, uh, there are now home sleep studies that are done and uh, the recommendation of our sleep folks is, is that people have an observed sleep study where sleep stages can be measured so that a, it would be preferable to have an, a, a sleep center sleep study if you have EDS um, rather than to have a home sleep study and to uh, press your clinician if, if, that's be, if a home sleep study is being proposed. Great, thank you. Now to Dr. Maitland, what are the best tests for MCAS if urine and lab tests come back negative? So the, the, the best test is actually getting some tissue biopsy of an organ that is impacted. So whether you've had an endoscopy or a colonoscopy or a skin biopsy would be really helpful because these are tissue-based cells. Um, another thing that you can get is serial tryptases. So um, I had one patient recently who um, had been treated for mast cell activation syndrome. She actually got COVID and her tryptase went up when she got COVID. And that was her first diagnosis of a lab marker that showed that she had mast cell activation syndrome. So you don't have to diagnose it all in one set. Some, this is, it's almost like looking for a heart attack, but now you're looking for a mast cell attack. So serial testing um, uh, is helpful. And also when it comes to the urine test, there's a lot of problems with how that those samples are handled. So if they're not kept cold, um, then the metabolites break down and they can be falsely negative. So there, there has to be efforts. And actually I believe Mayo Clinic just came out with a spot uh, urine test for prostaglandins, which would also be suggestive of a hypersensitivity disorder as well. Great, very helpful, thank you. And okay. can I, uh, can I ask? Yes, please do. Next question. Um, the example I showed was um, uh, um, of the localized measurement of mediators, and I'm wondering in the mast cell activation consensus documents, how do they handle measurement of local local evidence of, of mediator release or in order to be max, mast cell activation syndrome, there has to be sufficient release to be measured in a systemic 
a sample? So, so the problem with histamine and prostaglandins is that they're made by other cells than mast cells. So, you know, neutrophils can do it, uh, basophils can do it. So it just says that you're having a hypersensitivity reaction. Honestly, um, and, and there's no standard, there's no standardization for it. But at, at this point in time, I would have to say um, your best bet is really to kind of just get a tissue biopsy and then and look at it as well. Um, they're, they're getting better. I, I don't think we're there for that type of testing on a commercial basis that would be, that would lend to uh, 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 or securing the mast cell diagnosis. So that would be my, my greatest concern. Um, and, and here's the thing, there was a really great paper that just came out by Matthew Hamilton who says that sometimes even if you don't have, even if you don't have the laboratory data, you can still treat because the medications that we're using for this are actually quite you know, have a good risk-benefit ratio. Um, and, uh, and also, if you're going to treat, you should set a time for how long you're going to treat to say, is it beneficial or not? Um, so, you know, if you keep on taking antihistamines and you're not getting any better, then you might not necessarily be looking at a mast cell disorder. And I think that's also important to understand as well. That's certainly something that we use in the respiratory world, is that you, you do a period of time where you do a treatment and, and you decide in advance, you'll try it for a month, you'll try it for three months, depending on the treatment and the effect. Um, and right. so we call it an N of one trial because you're looking, you, know, it, you can't I, study everything. And, and also the evidence in clinical trials applies to people that are very different. So you really need to know for an individual. And also, right. not, so I'm, I'm curious, do you like, when if you have someone and you think they're having symptoms, um, the two ways you can approach it is to do one, you know, add on one agent at a time and gradually layer on therapies. And the other approach is you sort of do the whole bucket of treatments and then narrow things down. And I'm, I'm very interested in your instincts over the years as to what you've learned as far as how to approach that question. So we actually just put an abstract together, so I'm crossing my fingers that we get to present it. Um, we've evaluated close to 1,000 patients over the past eight or nine years. And interestingly enough, close to 50% of them have an immunodeficiency. So they're, they're, the, the, the manifestations and signs and symptoms of mast cell activation really was a hypersensitivity response saying that there's something else wrong, you need to figure that out. So what, I've, what we've discovered up to this point is you know, we've identified mannose binding lectin deficiency, uh, common variable immunodeficiency, immune-mediated neuropathies. I really think if the data does not point, you don't respond to the medications and, and, you, and the data does not support mast cell disorder, I think you need to start looking for other entities um, in order to get a better, you know, to, to, to get a better therapeutic plan in place. And by the way, you know, even for recalcitrant mast cell disorders, Using certain medications such as IVIG, we, ac we actually use that and it's found that people who have mast cell disorders in the context of either an autoimmune disorder or an immunodeficiency can respond to medications like IVIG depending on the dosing. So it really is peeling off the layers. Um, uh, all, um, one other test actually which would be really important to mention, I'm sorry, is the, the multiplication of the tryptase gene. So if you see a tryptase of six or higher, it's worth getting the duplication, you know, getting the gene by gene test to see whether or not there's multiples of the gene, because that will also help secure a diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome as well. And, uh, and so the, at this point in time, we really don't know what a normal tryptase is. You really wanna get a baseline and see whether they increase or not. Um, but it, you know, I have one patient, it literally took eight years to figure out that she had hyperalpha tryptasemia, which was complicated by um, chronic immune demyelinating polyneuropathy, POTS, and turns out she had hypermobile type ehlers danlos syndrome. So I'm going to jump in. I'm so sorry because we've got a long list of questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. 
No, we're, we're, we're doing a beautiful example of all teach, all learn right here, but we have a long list. So I'm going to quickly ask Dr. Bascom, do you see an increased risk in pneumothorax in EDS? Yes, it's not common, but it is certainly uh, can occur. And the presentation of pneumothorax would typically be a pleuritic pain, which would be a sharp pain that would be when you're taking a deep breath, as well as a sensation of breathlessness. Um, and if present, can be readily diagnosed with a chest pain, the emergency room if it's very severe and get a chest x-ray, uh, and can be treated with a, if it's mild, a um, Heimlich valve, a, a small tube put between your ribs with a one-way valve to help bring it back up, and if more severe, uh, sometimes you need pleurodesis, which would be a surgical procedure to help tap the lung up. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Maitland, while it's still early days, is there any indication that COVID-19 affects individuals with EDS or MCAS differently? And are those with EDS or MCAS more at risk? So the data that we have in our practice and then also which is coming out of, of uh, Brigham and Women's Mass Cell Center shows that there might be a silver lining to having these other comorbid disorders. It seems that um, we've had only two people in our practice have it and then Matt and Brigham Women's have, re have reported 30 and everybody had mild disease. And I think that's the reason for that is one, they're on medications that are, have been used to uh, help treat, including Montelukast, uh, as well as famotidine. And they're also, some of them are actually on biologics as well. There was a paper that just came out that showed an uh, individual that was on uh, dupilumab or dupixent was protected from having a, a, a conversion of the sinus disease going beyond the sinuses as well. So there seems to be something about the confusion of the immune system that does not allow that hypersensitivity response to, to, to develop. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll find out more and more as time goes on. Um, uh, Dr. Bascom, can there be a laxity uh, low tone in the diaphragm with hypermobile EDS to impact the ability to have a productive cough leading to, leading to increased frequency or severity of, of respiratory illness? That's an interesting question. I think one of the easy ways to get a feel for that, the way we have in the lab, is with um, inspiratory pressure of the diaphragm. And generally, uh, people are able to generate a pressure. Um, but the most important thing is to be able to take a good breath because it's, it's with full inspiration that then you're powered up to be able to talk. The peak flow meter that people use for asthma measures the force of that exhalation. And so if you're wondering if that's possible, um, I think laxities can, can have a variety of impacts. Um, so I, have not, I have not seen that that is. I have seen other in the trachea. Uh, and so with a forced cough in the trachea, um, um, it, it is this excess gap that I mentioned. Um, and so then the secretions can build up behind the trachea. Um, a flutter device uh, can, can help with that. Thank you. And that's all we have time for. We have so many questions, but as always, if you haven't been answered, then please contact our helpline. The details are in the chat. Thank you both. I think, um, sorry we had to cut your talk short, Dr. Maitland, but it will be available on Monday. And we've got so many great resources from you on our website that people can go and check out. And Dr. Bascom, I think this is a new area that, that's being thought about in EDS and HSD, and I think it's a really important one. So thank you both uh, for joining us today. We now have a break for eight minutes, more wriggling, giggling, and whatever you want to get up to. And uh, can we just have a look, Dr. Maitland, in that hoodie? Is that, yep. that what I thought? You know, I, I, will, I will always speak for a hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right, wonderful. Thank you, and we'll see everyone in eight minutes for Miss America. Thanks, everyone.